All right, guys, let's go in our Bibles tonight to the book of Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to start there tonight. Let's, uh, we've already worshiped, let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us. He's the great teacher tonight, and it's not so much what I do as what he does that's important tonight. I do want to remind you, all of my notes, 100%, and guys, tonight sitting in front of me are, let me look here, six pages of notes. People will pay good money for this. If I put this in a book, I could charge a lot for it. There's six pages of notes. I will not get through all of these notes tonight. They're on the website. They're free for you to download. I would encourage you, make you a three-ring binder. And whether it's me or Pastor Steve or anybody else teaching, if we make our notes available, put them in there. I have three-ring binders with, with thousands of messages in it that pastors who have influenced my life have preached. Go home and study them. Don't take what I teach as gospel. You study the truth, and uh, the Holy Spirit will show you what truth is, right? Let's ask Holy Spirit to help us. Holy Ghost, thank you that you're the great teacher tonight. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God's going to say to us. Give us eyes to see. Give us hearts to receive and minds to comprehend the word of the living God that changes us in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen and amen. Thank you, son. All right. We started a series, oh Lord, it's it, it been a month now where we've been discussing questions that have been posed uh, or asked. We've entitled this series, You Asked For It, because um, the world right now has some really hard questions, and our premise is, is that believers need to have really good answers. We as Christians should have good answers to difficult questions. One of the difficult questions that we recently looked at Sunday was are we alone in the universe? And we entitled this part of that kind of uh, this part of that as out of this world because we're talking about uh, the sightings that the government has put forth and talked about UFOs, UAPs, the recent Pentagon release of declassified information. And so tonight we're going to continue that and we're going to delve deeper into... Uh, interdimensional activity and possibly what I believe we're seeing is angels in the atmosphere and specifically fallen angels. Not that we couldn't be seeing good angels, but I do believe we're seeing fallen angels in the atmosphere. The reason I believe that is because 100%, 100% of all what we call close encounters of the fourth kind or fourth degree and close encounters are uh, UFO experiences are classified from one to four, one being just seeing something in the sky to four being a personal encounter like an abduction, three being a close encounter. That's where we get the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The fourth one being abductions. Of all the fourth encounters, which is over five million in the United States alone, every single one of them reported as an evil, demonic, scary scenario. If that be the case, then these interdimensional beings, if they are angels and they're not of this world, they're evil in nature. All right? So with that, let's delve in tonight. The universe throbs with life. The universe throbs with life. In fact, the entire cosmos is brimming with a myriad of life. And part of that life is something that you and I, the Bible calls the angelic host. Unfortunately, for the body of Christ, most Christians understand very little about the invisible realm or the spirit realm. Even in churches, there's not much teaching about the realm of the spirit at all. And sadly, even in Pentecostal churches, a lot of them, they don't teach this. So tonight, my desire, the lesson tonight is designed to do one thing, and that is to stir you for an understanding and also prepare you for interaction. Not just understanding, but prepare you for interaction with the invisible spiritual realm because you and I are designed to interact with that realm. Folks, whether it be the manifestations of the Holy Spirit from that dimension into our dimension, or it be encounters with angels. As Paul says, You sometimes we could entertain angels unaware. You and I have been designed to interact with the spirit realm, right? So my goal tonight is to take you through a very methodical teaching 
and with a little bit of preaching, get a little spice on it for you just to give you an understanding and interest and stir your desire to be active, but also to equip you with some discernment about what might necessarily be evil that we're interacting with uh, as well, okay? So first of all, if you're going to take notes, I want you to write this down. My first point tonight is going to be the invisible rim. Let's talk about the invisible rim for a moment. Now, in the 17th or the 13th century, the 13th century, there was a Hebrew scholar that was studying Genesis chapter 1 and came up with an understanding from studying just the Hebraic text of Genesis chapter 1 that there were at least 10 dimensions. He was excommunicated for what he discovered. Einstein later came along and other scientists, and they also discovered that they believed they could prove mathematically that there were at least 10 dimensions. There could be more, but we know that there's at least 10 dimensions. Now, the reason I'm bringing that to you is because what they're saying is, is there is or there are, rather, realms that are real. They're very, there's dimensions that are real. They just aren't visible to us. Just because something vis is, is, isn't visible to you or I doesn't mean that it's not real, right? I told you the story one time when I was teaching a little along these lines about my son going to Mississippi with me to do music, and he stayed in the hotel room and got eat up with bed bugs. He never saw the bed bugs, but that didn't make them non-existent. Non they were real, right? So just because we don't see it with our natural eyes doesn't mean that it's not there. So let's talk about the invisible realm for a moment. Colossians 1.16, for by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, that are visible and invisible. Say those two words with me, please. They are visible and invisible. One more time. They are visible. So notice here, we can deduct by this statement that everything that was created, that there are things in a realm or a dimension that is invisible that has been created. And then he goes on to define some of them as being thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. Those words are going to become important for us a little later in the teaching if we get far enough along. If not, Sunday morning, I will deal with those words in a very deep manner that I think will open up some understanding of what he's talking about. All things were created through him and they're created for him. Everything that exists exists because of him and for his existence. So again, the Bible is very clear that there is a visible rim and there is an invisible rim. Now, creation was formed on two levels. I told you I was going to introduce you to some of my family members tonight. This is Mr. and Miss Flatland. We call them Mr. and Miss Two Dimension, right? And the reason they're two-dimensional is because all they, can, they can't see up. They can only see in two dimensions. You see that? They can only see in two dimensions. If they could see up, they could see a third dimension. So you and I actually interact in a three-dimensional perspective, right? We can see width, we can see length, width and length, but we have the ability also to see up into the heavens. We can see depth, so we see three dimensions. But we also know that there is a fourth dimension that all of us interact with called time. So time is also beyond this right here, but we interact with time. So most people in church are like Mr. and Miss Two Dimension. They only think that what exists is what they can see around them. And then even at that, they operate in a very limited perspective because they can't see up here. They can only see here, which means they can only see a portion of one of the dimensions or on this plane, right? So they would literally have to move all the way around just to be able to get a complete picture. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Because they can't see up, they only see length and width, they, would have to, they can only see a portion of this at a time. So they have to study this. Most Christians spend all of their life bumping into the flesh realm, trying to understand just the flesh realm. We spend our whole life circling 
just flesh. Not realizing that God has given us eyes, spiritual eyes, to realize there's something more about us. Now look at this. If I were to take a piece of paper right here, I'm doing my best here to kind of give you a picture. A picture's worth a thousand words, right? If I take a piece of paper and I were to put it right on top of this, they still couldn't see it because they can't see up. They can only see length and width. Is everybody following me? So they can't see it. So here's this whole dimension that's setting right on top of them, and they can't see it. God could be right here, literally, less than a paper's width away from them, and they couldn't see it. So when Jesus makes statements like this, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth, just because you can't see him doesn't mean that he's not here. When he makes statements like this, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Well, there's more than two or three of us here tonight, which means Jesus somehow is right here in this place at this moment, just because you can't see. Listen, he could be as close to you as a paper setting right on top of you, and you might not be able to discern that he's there or see it. This is why we need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is the reason we need to be full of the Spirit of God. It makes us sensitive to the spirit realm, right? This is why we need Paul, what Paul prayed. May the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. We need God to open our eyes that there's more than just what we see here. Because folks, how boring of a Christian life do we have if that's all you see right there, right? So we don't, we got to realize there's more out there. Everything was created by Jesus, visible and invisible. Now listen to me. All of creation, visible, invisible, everything was created on two levels, two levels. You say, where's that found? Hebrews chapter 1. All this is in the Bible, folks. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It's going to be on the screen. God, who at various times in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Say that with me. He made the what? The worlds, plural, not one. He made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on hand, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance attained a more excellent name than they. Now what this scripture is telling us is that Jesus, because God took on flesh the way everything was created, according to Colossians chapter 1, everything is in two dimensions, a physical dimension, a spiritual dimension. Now, y'all remember Sunday morning, I taught you that for the most part, not, not completely, but for the most part, science and modern day science, their worldview does not make room for a non-physical reality. Everything has to be tested by what they see, taste, touch, feel. It's got to go through some kind of tangible empirical process, right? Their worldview doesn't make room for the metaphysical. It doesn't make room for an, a non-physical reality. But as Christians, the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview, makes room for a non-physical reality called the realm of the spirit. Everything Jesus created, both visible and invisible, whether there be thrones in this dimension, the physical dimension, or in the spiritual dimension. So everything that's been created has been created in two dimensions. The physical world is just one part of God's creation. In fact, it's probably the smallest part of God's creation, the physical world. This realm, according to the Bible, is temporal and will ultimately be destroyed and replaced by a new heaven and a new earth. That's found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to 
uh, ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. There's coming a day when this temporal rim that we see is going to be melted away, and it'll be replaced by a new heaven and a new earth. So this physical world is temporary as we know it right now. One day it'll change. It'll, it'll still have a physical reality, but it'll be different. But the spirit world, the spirit world, this world is more permanent. It's more real than the physical world. The physical world, listen, has no lasting attributes. There's not one thing on this planet that's going to have a lasting attribute. Not one. But the spirit realm has eternal attributes that last forever. And it's impossible for us to put our mind around uh, eternity. So that is the invisible realm, right? Now let's talk about the invisible beings that are in the invisible realm. The Bible only tells us of something called, other than saints who make their way in their spirit bodies, to uh, that heavenly place, that heavenly abode, the Bible only makes us aware of one other creatures or creatures called angels. In these angels that are in the invisible realm, these beings fall in two categories, good and evil angels. Anybody who's been a Christian very long at all, studied the Bible at all, knows that there was a time when there was a massive rebellion. Massive rebellion. I'm often asked the question, why did God allow Adam and Eve to be tempted by Satan? Why did he even put them in the garden if he knew that they were going to be tempted and they were going to fall? Why would he do that? Because there was a massive rebellion that was going on in the realm of the spirit. And now you have these two beings here. And one thing God's going to make sure of a fact of is that the two beings that are there now in this new place is not going to have the same spirit of the rebel that led the massive rebellion. So God's always going to test any being to make sure they're going to remain holy or set apart unto God. Selah. Go home and chew on that one for a little while. All right, angels. Let's talk about these angels, the, these invisible beings. They're referred to over 300 times in the Bible. They're referenced in 34 of your 66 different books. They are supernatural, celestial beings of the spirit, supreme to human in power, goodness, beauty, intelligence, and ability. They have free wills. These beings in the other realm, whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers, they have free will, just like you and I have free will. How do we know this? Because Satan is a prime example of this. If you go home and read Isaiah chapter 14, Satan said, I will, I will. If he didn't have a free will, he wouldn't be able to say, I will. He'd have to be say, he wills, right? But these beings have wills, so they can obey God, they can disobey God, just like you and I uh, can as well. Uh, the Bible tells us that angels were essential and were witnesses, eyewitnesses of creation, that's found in Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7. We won't go read that, but you can go study it. The Bible says the sons of God, which were angels, shouted for joy when God put the world, spoke the world into existence. So they've been around much longer than we have. Um, they, all of the angels are created beings belonging essentially to, essentially to, and there's a reason I'm saying essentially to, the invisible realm. But they can come in and have the ability to manifest in the natural realm. The only way to see an angelic host is to walk in the spirit. Unless he makes his, himself known through physical means, and in the scripture sometimes they would take on the appearance of human beings or take on the form of human beings like the two men going down to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, the two angels. Most of the time, the only way you'll ever see a, an angelic host is for God to open your eyes spiritually. Y'all remember the servant of Elisha when they were surrounded by the Assyrians. The prophet said, Lord, open his eyes. He went and looked, to, looked through the window shade, and he saw the angelic host of God, the armies of God, all upon the mountains uh, surrounding and encamping the, the enemies uh, of God. 
God had to open his eyes to do that, and God can open your eyes to do that. Now, with that said, let me be careful to say this to you. You will not find a pattern in Scripture where somebody's always seeing angels all the time. And you will not find a pattern in Scripture where somebody who is seeing an angel all the time who is not fearful when they show up. So be careful of somebody who comes to you and tells you all the time, well, they're talking to an angel or they're seeing an angel. I'm not saying that it's not possible. I'm just saying that it shouldn't be this experience where it's just happening all the time, all the time. There's no scriptural pattern for that. If there is, go find it, show it to me in the Word of God, and I'll back up on what I'm teaching here. So what do they look like? What do angels look like? Because the way we have angels pictured is little bitty naked babies with a pamper diaper on and little wings and they're floating on a cloud and they got a little harp in their hand singing kumbaya as they float by. That's the way we think angels. Or we think angels always show up as these big, beautiful beings with, with wings spread. There is scripture for that, but there's so many more angels than just what quote, unquote, everybody sing. Well, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2 says that angels can look like people. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by do so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. You could be sitting by an angel tonight. Yeah? <laughs> Bonnie just looked over at her husband and said, I know that's not you. <laughs> so, so, so. so anyhow, <clears throat> come on. Um, angels could be moving and listen, probably are moving within our midst of humanity in a lot of different facets, and we're just not discerning that that's who is there or that's what they are. Uh, I personally believe that I've had two encounters with an angel. One was when I was called to preach a little, a little shortly after I was called to preach at the age of 12. A man got in my car. My dad picked up a uh, hitchhiker. We were driving down the road. This hitchhiker started talking the Word of God. I'm talking about quoting Scripture like it was unbelievable. Started talking about heaven as if he dwelt there. And the next thing we know, uh, my, he said, just pull over right here. This is where I need to get off. We weren't close to an exit. We were on the side of the interstate, nothing but open fields. My dad tried to talk him out of it. He said, no, i got to get off right here. He gets out of the car. He blesses us as he gets out of the car. My dad stopped the car, drove just a few feet, stopped the car to get out to help the man with some money, and the man was gone. No tracks, we couldn't find him. I know that there was an, that had to be an angel that showed up that day in the car. We entertained an angel, unaware. We didn't know it till after it was over. The second time I had an encounter with an angel was in Smithville, Tennessee. I was pastoring a church, and we were going through a storm, and I was on the front of the church sweeping the front porch of the church, and a man walked up out of the blue. Now, our church was on a triangle like this right here. Church was sitting in the middle of the triangle. I could see all the way around it. It's Smithville, folks. It's not like it's a metropolis, right? <laughs> and this man walked up. I asked the man. It was a very hot day. I said, do you need, can I get you some water? And he said, no, I have no need of that. I said, can I get you food? He said, I have no need of that. I offered to give him money. He said, I have no need of that. And then all of a sudden, he gave me a direct word from the Lord. He said, son, the Lord said this and gave me a direct word from the Lord. And I tried again to give him something to eat, to drink, give him money. He said, I have no need of that. I said, well, God bless you. Please be safe on your journey. I turned around to the door like this, and I meant to say something. I thought to say something else. I turned back around. He was gone. I ran around the building. and ran up and down the roads. He was gone. I realized that day that God had sent an angel, I believe, with all my heart, and God rescued us from a situation. God intervened. So I believe that angels are moving in our midst right now, and they could even be visiting our church services. They could be visiting, folks, they could be visiting your family, and you don't even know it. So sometimes y'all are praying, Lord, save my loved one. God could be sending an angel with a word. Just Some of you in here shouldn't even be alive right now. The only reason you're alive is because some mama or grandmama somewhere prayed for you, and God sent an angel to encamp around about you. Amen? Um, angels have ability to take on human appearance. Again, Genesis chapter 19, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, Gomorrah makes this clear to us. But angels can also be extremely frightening. Now, that's contrary to what we've 
thought or learned in Christendom, but it's what the Word of God teaches. This, what I'm about to read to you, is repeated multiple times, a plethora of places in the Word of God. I'm just grabbing one example, Daniel chapter 10, verse number 8. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned into frailty. I retained no strength. He was seeing an angel, and he described when he saw the angel, he said, I became frail when I saw the angel. In other words, it scared me to death. It it terrified me. So I have a problem. Everybody tells me they're always seeing angels, and there's no fear involved with it, especially no fear of God, that we say it so flippantly, like it's not a big deal to God for us to make statements like that. Folks, in most cases, every time an angel would show up with a human being in the Word of God in almost every case, they would begin their dialogue with three words, don't be afraid. Why do you think they would say that? Because when they showed up, ah, people would freak out. They were afraid, right? There isn't one single person in Scripture. Think about this. There isn't one single person in Scripture who was excited to see an angel. Think about it. One single person who's excited about seeing an angel. Now, the ones who saw them and didn't know what they were, they had different reactions. For example, in Genesis chapter 21, verse 6, Sarah laughed. She didn't know what she was dealing with, and she laughed, right? Luke chapter 1, verse 34 Listen to this, Mary protested. How would you like to fight with an angel? Right? Mary protested. Luke chapter 1, verse 20, Zechariah argues, Zacharias rather, argues with an angel. So when a lot of times when people don't know they're angels, they have very human responses, very natural, quick responses. But when they realize it's an angel, they're not excited to see him because it, it can mean a lot of things. Now, if that's, now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about where are the angels? Where are the angels? Psalms 24, verse number one says, the earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Everything that we see here right now, visible and invisible, is the Lord. The earth is the possession of the Lord. Psalms 148 verses 1 through 3 tell us clearly that most angels are stationed in heaven. Psalm 148 verses 1 through 3. Just go home and read it. Most angels are stationed in heaven. But Psalm 34 verse 7 says, angels encamp round about the saints. So there are angels who are on divine assignment that are in They might not be in our dimension, but they're here. We can't see them, but they're here. And they could be as close as your breath right now. And you not even know that they're there because of their interdimensional beings. Is this helping anybody understand a little bit of the spirit realm? This is the reason, again, I always read this verse to you. One of the most important verses in all of the Word of God is the first one. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. Dimensions, there's so much more than just what we see. The heavens, plural, and the earth, singular. Think about that, folks. So again, these angels, these beings could be here right now. The Bible says they encamp round the saints who fear him. Anybody in here fear the Lord today? Anybody here love Jesus tonight? Well, guess what? There's angels all around you right now. In fact, did you know the book of Matthew teaches that the angels of the Lord behold the face of God on behalf of little ones? So when we were growing up, we were taught, you know, you have a um, guardian angel. You know that's scriptural? It's not just a Catholic tradition. The book of Matthew says that your, your little ones, little ones, have an angel who beholds the face of the Lord on their behalf. Guardian angels. So they're much more involved in our life than we think they are. You say, well, hold it, Pastor. There's 7 billion people on the planet. 
How many angels are you? Are there? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. You know the Bible actually tells you how many angels there are? Do you know that? It's found in Deuteronomy, or Daniel rather, chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. Daniel said, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was as white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a flaming fire. Its wheels were a burning fire. Its wheels, think about that. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, and a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the court was seated, and the book was open. A thousand thousands. Ten thousand times ten thousand. Revelation chapter 5, verse number 11 goes on to confirm it. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, right? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 says, You've come to Mount Zion, the holy city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. Listen, to an innumerable company of angels. How many angels are there? There's so many you can't even count them. They can't even be counted. They're innumerable. Thousands of thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. Basically what the writers are saying is I see nothing but a sea of angels out across there. A sea of angels. So you say, well, hold it. How many are fallen and how many are righteous angels or good angels, godly angels? Still on the Lord's side. I don't know. I know people teach one-third of the angels fell with Lucifer, but that's found in Revelation chapter 12. That's in the middle of the tribulation period. That's a middle tribulation scripture, so you can't make that apply to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. I don't know how many fell with Lucifer, but what I can tell you is the Bible says there's more of them that be with us than there are that be with him. So if there's an innumerable company of angels, it doesn't matter because we got more on our side than they got on their side, right? I love it. Now, so what, let's, let's go back and let's look for a moment. We've talked about the invisible realm. We've talked about invisible beings. We've talked about what these angels are or where these angels are, how many there are. Now let's talk about the order of the invisible realm. Because over here, and I'm going to ask Noah if he can, go back to Colossians chapter 1, verse number 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible. But one notice now, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers... So what the Word of God is doing here is the Word of God is showing us there is an order. So as I read to you Sunday, Paul said there's an order to the terrestrial, there's an order to the celestial, there's a glory in the terrestrial realm and a glory in the celestial realm. Every dimension, look at me folks, every dimension has an order to it. Every, every dimension has laws to it that are governing, and God created them all and set them all. And in many ways, this dimension is a mirror of those dimensions. I'm going to show you that in the Word of God, right? And so that's the reason today I was watching a video this afternoon for coming because uh, one of these days God's going to give me a camper. I'm going to get to go camping. I always wanted a camper. Pam and I are going to have a motorhome, and that's going to be something we're going to do. I'm just warning you. At some point in the, in the future somewhere, God's going to get blessed with a motorhome. And I was watching this place that I've always wanted to go called Ure, California, or Colorado. Ure, Colorado. It's supposed to be the Swiss Alps of America. I'm going to go to Ure, Colorado, and I'm going to go there and just hang out. And I believe when I get to heaven, God's going to build me a beautiful house, put everything in it I like, and he's going to position it somewhere in the mountains that looks like Ure, Colorado, probably much prettier than Ure, Colorado. So that, that rim mirrors, or this rim mirrors that rim. All right, let's talk about the order of the invisible because the order was established before the creation of the world. Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, they are all under, all of them are under Christ's sovereign rule, even the wicked 
dimension. They're under Christ's sovereign rule. I want to show it to you now. Job chapter 1 verse 6. Everybody just look at the screen. Job chapter 1 verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, these are angels, but not Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also was among them. So it tells us that Satan was a created angel, and God's got Satan on a leash. Before Satan can do anything, he's got to come to the throne and get permission. Why is that? Because every dimension has an order. And through him were all things created and for him and by him. They all exist. Everything exists for him. He's in charge of it. His sovereign rule is over everything. Now, they're rebels. They're rebels. But God, if anything happens, it's because God allowed. I'm just telling you the facts. Now, there might be some stuff happening we don't understand, but God knows things we don't know, right? Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, and suddenly they cried out. These are the demons crying out of the man saying, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Even the demons know that Jesus is the son of God. Have you come here to torment us before our time? In other words, every, this is the way I like to look at it. I don't know if it's this way. Every evil spirit, whether it's a fallen angel or a demonic spirit, every one of them have a stopwatch on and the hand's moving, and they know that at any moment the alarm clock could go off. So when Jesus showed up to cast them out of that man, they said, have you come to torment us before? It ain't time yet. The clock ain't went off. What you doing here, Jesus? Right? I love that. Revelation chapter 12, 12 uh, verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, you dwell in the woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you. But here's the ki- kicker. He has great wrath, but he knows that he has a short time. He knows. Say that. He knows. Say it again. He knows. That ought to fire you up. Right? So every time the devil attacks you, just say, okay, devil, your day's coming. You know it. You know it. You got a short time. So what I'm trying to show you is this, is in the order of the invisible, whether it's good or fallen in the invisible realm, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power, everything is under Christ's sovereign rule. You and I should not fear that realm. I'm talking about fear it in that that God is not protecting us and that his sovereign work in our life isn't protected for us. I'm telling you right now, if Satan were to launch a demonic angel against your life to carry out some kind of order... God would launch many more angels towards your life to rescue you in the nick of time because God has said that no weapon formed against you can prosper. And if you want to really get excited, read about the angels in Psalm 91 who will bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. And the Bible says the angels will bear you up. Isn't that awesome? That makes me so excited. I want to jump down and run off the platform tonight, I'll be honest with you. All right? Now, with, that, with this information, this is all introduction, and I didn't cover not even a drop in the bucket of the 300 scriptures that talk about angels in the Bible. Can we deal with a little something? And I'll go into a deeper Sunday. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom. Now, why am I talking about this kingdom? Because I told you there's an order to every dimension, right? Thrones, principalities, powers, there's an order to it. Every kingdom, Jesus said, divided against itself, is brought to desolation. Every city or every house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come to you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man And then he will spoil his house. Now let me just, there's a lot of different directions. I could take this one scripture here and teach for a month, literally, out of this one scripture. But basically, what I want us to get tonight is spiritual darkness, as you and I know, is increasing. 
The Bible says gross darkness will cover the people. Spiritual darkness is increasing. Evil men will wax worse and worse. Spiritual darkness is increasing. And in the last days, there'll be a, a, an invasion of demonic spirits, seducing spirits, preaching demonic doctrine, leading people astray. Wickedness is, spiritual darkness is increasing and becoming more and more sophisticated. But I want you to listen to me. I, I gave you a principle Sunday morning, and y'all were about so fried from the information I gave you, you didn't catch the principle that I shared. I shared with you that Hugh Ross and other astrophysicists, when it comes to these um, UFOs, UAPs, and these close encounters, they made a statement that they have proven or they have scientifically tested, and they say that you can test it even further to prove it, that these manifestations that are happening personally and publicly are happening in places or with people who have direct involvement with the occult or in areas where a doorway or dimension of extreme spiritual wickedness has been opened up. So if spiritual, if flesh has the ability to open these portals and these dimensions, look at me, folks. There are entities and things that are right here that want to work an agenda down into our dimension. All they're waiting on is for the veil to be unzipped, to be ripped. And you say, I don't believe that. Well, all you got to do is study 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Because Paul said, it's not, the, it's not the fact that you're giving an offering to an idol or that you're eating a meat offering to the idol. It, he said, the idol's nothing. It's wood. It's stone. It's plastic. It's nothing. It's man-made. He said, but what you don't realize is that there is an entity behind that physical object. There is, you, are, you are doing something in the seen, but there's something in the unseen that has the ability to break into the scene if you open the window. If you open the door to it. So Proverbs says, a curse without a cause can't come. As a bird by wandering, a curse causeless cannot come. In other words, that wicked spirit has to have a way in. So again, if spiritual darkness is increasing and becoming more sophisticated. Now, how would spiritual darkness become more sophisticated? Because we're becoming more sophisticated, right? Right? We're making new discoveries all the time. We're becoming more sophisticated. They're working hand-in-hand hand with our sophistication. Our, some of our methods are opening these realms or these dimensions up and allowing these spirits to break in or these beings to break in. Now, if he is true, if, he, if what he says is true, that you can map where there are pockets of great concentrations of spiritual wickedness or manifestations of the flesh, contrary God-haters and God adi- uh, anti-God attitudes, that you have these manifestations breaking in, then what that means is we should be able to geographically pattern evil and spiritual operation and oppression. We should be able to pattern it. Now, I want you to listen to me right now. You're not going to find anything I'm teaching in a Bible bookstore. And there are going to be a gazillion people going to think I'm a nut that fell off a tree. But I'm telling you right now, you can pattern wickedness. And you can lock down that certainly... A, why, why is it that certain parts of the United States or certain parts of the world have more tendencies and more proclivity? Is it just because there's more liberals there than there are conservatives? Is that the case? Or is it that we're doing things that are opening windows of of opportunities for these things to break in to our dimensions? Again, don't look at God as out there on the other side of the universe. God's here with us now. Don't look at these spirits as being on the other side of the view. No, folks, they're here, right? You guys need to study Planck theory. Learn a little bit about that. Study a little bit about interdimensionality. It won't hurt you to use your brain a little bit. Not everything that, that science is studying. Do you realize that when, when, when Einstein saw the ten dimensions, he started studying the Bible 
and he got hungry to know the Bible, what you and I know is the Hebrew Bible code today because he realized there had to be more, it'll do the same thing for you. All right, so there is geographical pattern to evil and spiritual oppression. That's obvious. We can look around and we see that. Thank God we live in Cookville. Now, Cookville has its spots of wickedness. See, y'all act like you done cut me off. And then I got, I got a little, little over knee deep, and now we want to... I stopped talking about angels. Now you're kind of freaking out on me. But there are patterns. There are places in Cookville, geographical places in Cookville. Our church happens to be sitting in one where wickedness has more of an advantage than other places. And you can pattern it. The police will tell you they can pattern it. The EMS men and women will tell you they can pattern it. The poverty index will tell you you can pattern it. It manifests itself in a million different ways. So if God knew that there would be a church called the Bend and he decided he wanted to put it anywhere he could put it in Cookville and he decided that we needed to start here, do you think that's an accident? Because I didn't pick this building. Steve didn't pick this building. In fact, I came and looked at this building and rejected it flat out. Said it's too much work, can't do it. But after we got to praying about it and counseling about it, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us that this is where we were supposed to be. I believe God wants to do something in this community to shake it up for the glory of God, right? I believe that. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. Now, if that's the case, if there is a geographical area where wickedness has an advantage and God is putting righteous people in that geographical area, it's because he's trying to overthrow and establish, as Pastor Steve's been teaching on the kingdom, he's trying to put a colony right here in the midst of this. Right? All right. If you go to this scripture, I'm trying to, I'm, in my mind, I'm, there's so much I want to teach you. It's all here. But I'm trying to, I don't want to, I don't want to put a fire hydrant to you tonight, Okay. But let's go back to the scripture. Can we put the scripture back up on the screen again? Let, let's go back to the scripture. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. Verse 25, rather. And Jesus knew thought, said, Every kingdom divided against itself can't stand. Then he comes down and he says, Every city or house divided against itself cannot stand. If you reverse the order in this scripture, Kingdom, city, house. If you reverse the order, house, city, kingdom, you actually see the protocol of how wickedness takes an area or how righteousness takes a territory or an area. If you want to divide the kingdom, you got to get the city divided. If you want to divide the city, you got to first get the house divided. So what we do is Jesus was actually giving us the protocol of how to take an area. Do you know how to root out wickedness in this area? We got to start in the house. We got to take the gospel to these houses around here. We got to get Jesus in the house. And every house that Jesus invades, it starts affecting this area of the city, which eventually affects the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of God in this area. How do you take a territory? You don't take a territory by having a great big revival service on, in August. Revival is about us. It's about getting Jesus in us, getting Jesus in our house, getting Jesus, the, the fullness of the Spirit of God in us so that we become stronger vessels for the Lord to be used. You don't bring Jesus into an area by bringing in the most popular camp meeting speakers. You know what that camp meeting is going to do? It's going to stir up the believers. That's what it's going to do. 
Now, are lost people going to get saved? Yeah, lost people are going to get saved. There'll be some that'll come in here. But by and large, we're not going to turn this area around by having these speakers. We're not even going to turn this area around by having a good church service. We've got to figure out how to get Jesus out of here into their houses some way to start dividing Satan's kingdom so eventually that kingdom crumbles. Right? You say, why is that important? Excuse me. Why is that important? I want to show you something in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And I think we'll close with this scripture tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now I'm going to read this out of the New Revised Standard Version because... When you take the original language, this is as close in the English language as I can give you as what the original text actually says. When the Most High appointed the nations, when he divided humankind or mankind, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the gods. The Lord's own portion was his people, and Jacob was his allotted share. Now just keep that scripture up there. Look at what the Bible's saying here. When the Most High appointed the nations, put the boundaries of the nations, when he divided the land and territories to mankind, he fixed the boundaries of it based on something, based on the number of the gods. Now, this phrase, the numbering of, of the gods, in, in, actually, I think in the old King James Version, it says the number of the angels. The ancient Hebrew mind would, number of gods, would be these angelic beings. In other words, what they would say is when God decided who's going to live where and what the nation was going to look like, he did it and he assigned the boundaries according to angelic involvement in those areas. The book of Revelation says there's four angels that stand on the four corners of the earth. Right? Now we know the earth is round. <laughs> I say that. Did y'all know Sunday, uh, the, the YouTube video I put up from Sunday's teaching, I actually had somebody get on there and let, tell me that the earth was flat. And so... We know the earth is round, right? So where's the four corners at? If I take this bottle, where's the four corners of that bottle? Now my point is you and I don't know where the polarity points are on that side. We have a north and a south pole, but evidently there's an east and a west pole. God knows exactly where they're at. Did you know there's four big angels that stand over every single one of them? And the Bible says they control four winds that blow on the earth. Four winds. We'll talk about those maybe Sunday, what those winds are. Four winds. In, in, in Daniel, we're, and we'll look at this Sunday, in Daniel, you have a chief angel who's over Greece, you have another chief angel who's over, uh, help me stay one, Persia. So here we have angels who are over geographic areas. And the Bible says, when the Most High appointed the nations, he divided humankind and he fixed the boundaries of people according to the number of gods or these spiritual beings. Now look at me. If that's the case, that's the reason God told his people, when you come into the land that I have given you, do not worship their gods. Why is that? Because look at this. If this is my promised territory and God has said, Israel, let's pretend this table is Israel. Israel is my possession and I have stationed angels at the borders. And we know that Michael fights for Israel. We know that Gabriel's involved with Israel. We know that from the Scripture and other angels. 
If this is the border, and God has set the border according to the, the operation of these spiritual beings, and then God tells his people, don't go in there and start worshiping the other gods. Why is he telling them that? Because whenever they worship other gods, they open doorways for those wicked spirits to watch now, to come in and do what we need to be doing to the kingdom of darkness, to start dividing houses, to start dividing cities, and eventually bring in the agenda of the kingdom of darkness into that realm. This is why when you see cities that are, and I, when I say conservative, I'm not talking about politically. I'm talking about conservative in that they have Judeo-Christian ethics in their cities. And then all of a sudden, over the course of a decade, that whole thing can be flipped to absolute total debauchery and wickedness. How did that happen? What happened was it started happening one house at a time as people started giving way to these other gods and they invited those spirits to come in and invade their land. So Ephesians 6.12, I think they can put that up. Ephesians 6.12. We'll quit with this. Y'all know this, but this. how about let's come back to this Sunday. When y'all get back Sunday, you're going to know everything and everybody else is going to be completely lost, right? So I need y'all to share it with all your friends and say, you need to watch this and then you come back Sunday, okay? He, Ephesians 6.12, y'all all know this scripture? But now this scripture ought to mean something more to you after just this little bit of teaching. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But it, that what, what realm is that one? That's a little flat people, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, here's the problem. If you have the scientific view that all there is is just the physical reality, material reality, and you don't believe in a non-physical reality, then you think whatever goes on is okay. So look at me. Out there in this world, they're blinded by the God of this world. Listen, the God of this world and this world system has blinded them. You and I look at gender confusion as completely crazy. They look at it as normal. Why is that? Because they don't believe in anything other than a physical material reality. They don't believe in a heaven. They don't believe in a hell. They don't believe in, an, in the word of God that is physical and metaphysical. They don't believe in that. You and I as Christians hold that worldview. And the only way to snatch them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son is to show them the word of God through the way we live and the way we talk and the way we speak and the way we present ourselves to the point that they want what's in us. Preach the gospel to them. That doesn't mean you have to get on a pulpit and preach. It just means you got to share Jesus with them. Share the fact that they're caught in darkness. Bring them out of the light. Learn how to give an answer for your faith. Right? We take it one house at a time because one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, 16 becomes 32, 32 becomes 64, 64 becomes 128 becomes Yo, we got one other person. Yo, everybody got filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues right there. Show love. Right? So again, look, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. All right? Now here's what we're going to do Sunday morning. Sunday morning we're going to come in and we're going to study these words, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness and heavy place. There's, there's certain words that the Apostle Paul used in the Greek language to describe that, to define that for us. And then also what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, let me just turn over here in my notes and sh tell you everywhere I'm going because it'll be good. See, I only got through two pages tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about dynasties of darkness that exist. Dynasties of darkness. We're going to talk about how demons attach themselves to locations and what does it take to get them out of a location. 
It's going to be so good. Amen? So, have y'all learned anything tonight? All right, let's do this. Let's stand up. Let me say the blessing over you tonight. Remember, all of my notes are on the website. You can go to thebend.me forward slash notes. Thebend.me forward slash notes, and you can get that. Let's lift our hands. Let me speak a blessing over you, and you can be dismissed tonight. Father, I thank you for everybody who's in this church tonight. I thank you for those who have watched us online tonight. I pray, God, that you would again awaken us to the realm of the Spirit. I pray that we would be led by the Holy Ghost, which means we would be more spiritually aware of what God wants to do than we are aware of what our flesh wants to do. I speak life over your people tonight. I speak the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and adds no sorrow to it. I thank you, Lord. They're the head and not the tail. They're above only. They're not beneath. They're going up. They're not going under in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to make your face to shine upon them. You're going to lift up your countenance over their life. You're going to give them grace and mercy, and you're going to grant them your peace tonight because they're your children in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. God bless you guys. I love you. I'll see you Sunday morning at 10:30. Make sure to share the feed and invite some people to come be with you.